Hello friends, my name is JJ. So Canada is a lot like America in oh so many ways, one of which being the amount of veneration we have for our historic leaders. Just as American kids are taught to care all about the different presidents in the hope that they may someday grow up to be weird president-obsessed adults, so too our Canadian children taught to care all about the different Canadian prime ministers until they become weird Canadian prime minister obsessed 36 year olds. So it is quite inexcusable that in all of my years making videos about Canada, I have never made a proper guide to the Canadian prime ministers. You know, just listing the basic facts about each guy and what they're known for and how they all fit together. So get ready because that's what we're gonna do today. And I'll even put them in one of those rainbow rank things because I am told that is what the kids today really go for. So we're gonna start our list in the year 1867. That was the year that the current Constitution of Canada was adopted, and the year that most people think Canada became a country in the modern sense. And the first prime minister of that new country was a guy called John Alexander MacDonald. In Canada, he is always referred to as John A. MacDonald, or sometimes Sir John A. Macdonald, because he was knighted by Queen Victoria. Macdonald is an incredibly famous guy in Canada, probably the one historical prime minister you would expect everyone to know. A lot of people think of him as the founder of Canada and a kind of Canadian George Washington. An analogy that Macdonald encouraged in his own time and even got paintings of himself done to look like him. So what did he do? Well, Macdonald was a big shot politician from the Conservative Party in the previous Canadian government, and he was one of the architects of the new constitution that went into effect in 1867. This new constitution expanded Canada's borders to create an American-style federation with other British colonies in North America, and Macdonald is seen as being at the center of all of the wheeling and dealing it took to set that up, as we can see in this patriotic educational video. And the time for union is now. I ask you to take the dare. Macdonald was then elected to lead that new government he helped create, and he ruled Canada for nearly 20 unbroken years. His long administration is most notable for annexing all of this additional territory, as well as spearheading the creation of a tremendous transcontinental railroad to tie the country together with a ribbon of steel, as the romantic phrasing of the time put it. Macdonald was briefly out of power from 1873 to 1878, when his government was voted out following various scandalous revelations about corruption between his political party and the big railroad companies. In his place, Canadians elected their first ever Liberal Party government, headed by a similarly named guy called Alexander Mackenzie. Mackenzie is not very well remembered today, and most of the things he did during his one and only term were things that Macdonald was in the process of doing anyway, like creating a Canadian Supreme Court, or passing the infamous Indian Act that established Canadian Indians as a separate class of citizen. The callous way in which the early Canadian prime ministers treated the native peoples of this country is something that is becoming an increasing source of controversy as of late, and has led many people to argue that we should probably stop venerating our early leaders quite so much. But that said, just in terms of how important John A. Macdonald was as a historic figure in helping form the Canadian Constitution and laying the groundwork for the continent-sized country that Canada is today, he would historically be considered one of Canada's S-tier prime ministers. Alexander Mackenzie, by contrast, is mostly forgotten and undistinguished, so he is probably best placed in the C-tier. Macdonald died in office in 1891, and four different men each briefly served as prime minister in the four years that followed. John Abbott, John Thompson, Mackenzie Bowell, and Charles Tupper. Macdonald was such a domineering personality that it was considered quite difficult to find a good replacement for him within the Conservative Party after his death. These four guys are thus just mostly known for symbolizing this politically chaotic time and accomplished virtually nothing of note. They're all F tier. In 1896, the last of these guys, Charles Tupper, a man who was only in office for two months, was defeated in an election by the Liberal Party led by Wilfrid Laurier. Laurier is considered another one of the very major figures of Canadian history and is probably the only other S-tier Prime Minister. He ruled for 15 years and his government is associated with settling all of this 
empty land yep. that McDonald had annexed, as well as presiding over Canada's growth into one of the major industrialized countries of the world, full of gold mines and wheat farms and lumber mills and so on. I made a whole separate award-winning video about Laurier's prime ministership. You should really check out. It's one of my favorite videos I've ever made. Laurier was in turn defeated in the 1911 election by conservative leader Robert Borden. Today we associate Borden mostly with Canada's participation in the First World War, which to this day is still something that is quite heavily sentimentalized as a time in which Canada sort of really made itself known as a powerful, serious country on the world stage and not simply a wimpy British colony. So he would be considered an A-tier Prime Minister. After two terms, Borden retired while still in office and was replaced as Prime Minister in 1920 by Interior Minister Arthur Mahon. Mahon had been Borden's right-hand man and was this very strident right-wing character who was very down on immigrants and labor unions and stuff. But we never really got to see how he would have handled the top job because after just a few months in office, he was voted out in favor of the Liberals under William Lyon Mackenzie King. Mahon was thus a very transient and irrelevant prime minister who has to be put in the Fs. Mackenzie King, by contrast, was the longest serving prime minister in Canadian history almost 22 years if you mush all of his dates together. And accordingly, he is associated with a great many important things, as you might expect for someone who hung around for so long. He'd go in the A tier with old man Borden. King negotiated Canada's final independence from Great Britain in 1931, and he laid the foundation for what we would now think of as the modern welfare state, introducing innovative social programs like old age pensions for seniors. However, in the height of the Great Depression in 1930, he was briefly voted out in favor of R.B. Bennett. Bennett was a wealthy conservative lawyer, and many historians believe he was a man woefully miscast to run Canada during an unprecedented period of poverty and unemployment. The standard argument is that he did not really grasp the full magnitude of the Depression, and it took him way too long to realize the sort of dramatic government action that would be needed to resolve it. Though he does have his defenders, he is quite widely regarded as having been a failed prime minister so let's put him in the D tier. Mackenzie King was elected back to power in 1935, while Bennett lived the rest of his life in exile in Great Britain. King's final terms are associated with Canada's entry and participation in World War II on the side of the Allies. This is another very sentimentalized period of Canadian history that's considered quite a heroic time for the country and has helped further consolidate King's A-tier reputation. I actually made a whole other award-winning video about King that you can watch as well. King finally retired in 1948 and was replaced by the man who had been his attorney general, Louis Saint Laurent. Prime Minister Saint Laurent is mostly forgotten about today, but he was quite important for presiding over Canada's big post-war economic transformation. Throughout the nine years he was in charge, the country continued to industrialize at quite a rapid clip, developing large multinational corporations, powerful banks, and a mighty oil industry all of which helped further establish Canada as one of the world's major capitalist powers. He didn't achieve anything particularly epic, but was a mostly popular and competent leader, so he'd be in the B tier. He did lose his bid for a third term to conservative John Diefenbaker, however. Diefenbaker remains a pretty famous prime minister today, in part because he had such a memorably quirky name and a rather flamboyant and eccentric personality. Dief would also be considered a man who presided over Canadian good times times in the late 50s and early 60s, and for a while he was quite popular because he was seen as this very good, upright, Christian sort of guy, but he also came to be seen as someone who just made a lot of bad decisions in Canadian foreign and military policy during the early years of the Cold War, and someone who just led a fairly disorganized administration more broadly. So he'd be in the C tier. Diefenbaker was voted out in 1963 in favor of Lester B. Pearson, who served a similarly shaky five years in office. Pearson was a career diplomat who had won the 1957 Nobel Peace Prize for his work bringing peace to the Middle East. But as prime minister, he had a lot of difficulty running a competent government in some of the same ways that Diefenbaker did. In fact, the decade between 1957 and 1968 is sometimes seen as Canada's time of troubles, in which the country suffered from chronically bad government. But that said, Pearson is generally considered better than Diefenbaker, just in that he achieved a few more tangible things during his tenure. He presided over the beginnings of what would become Canada's much beloved 
public health care system. He created the Maple Leaf flag, and he entered into an arrangement with the United States that brought nuclear missiles into Canada as part of a Cold War defense strategy. This technically made Canada into a nuclear armed state, depending on how you classify that. Because his legacy has withstood the test of time a bit better, I would say Pearson is more of a B, though in his own time, people would have called him a C at best. Pearson retired in 1968 and was replaced by Attorney General Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who many would argue was the most important Canadian Prime Minister of modern times. He remains very controversial to this day, but he'd have to be put in the A tier just in terms of the magnitude of what he accomplished. Trudeau served for nearly 15 straight years and introduced a lot of the policies that we think of as defining Canada today. This included making English and French Canada's official languages, the embrace of protectionist measures to protect certain Canadian industries from market competition, high spending on social programs, self-governance rights for the Aboriginal Canadians, increased non-European immigration, and a foreign policy that emphasized emphasized independence from U.S. leadership. But most significantly, his government also substantially amended the Canadian Constitution in order to entrench fundamental human rights and forbid future governments from infringing them. This was probably the single greatest change to Canadian law and democracy since the Constitution was first adopted in 1867. And in the same way that people say John A. Macdonald was the architect of the old Canada, it is popular to say that Pierre Elliott Trudeau was the architect of the new Canada. Like most of Canada's long-serving prime ministers, Trudeau was briefly kicked out of office at one point. In 1979, he narrowly lost his bid for a fourth term to Joseph Clark, the young new head of the Conservative Party. The conventional wisdom on Clark is that he could have served a couple decent years as prime minister if he'd been a little bit better at parliamentary maneuvering. But instead, the parliament voted no confidence in him after only eight months in office due to breakdowns in negotiations over his budget plans. History nerds might find it interesting to know that he was the guy in charge when the famous Canadian scheme to rescue American hostages from the U.S. Embassy in Iran went down. Who were the last three prime ministers of Canada? Uh, Trudeau, Pearson, and Diffenbaker. But that's not enough to save him, and he would have to go in the F tier as well. When Pierre Elliott Trudeau finally left for good in 1984, John Turner took over. Turner was prime minister when I was born, so I always feel a little bit sentimental about him. He also just died relatively recently, so I guess he's gotten a bit of a nostalgia boost from that as well. Turner had been finance minister under Trudeau and was considered to come from the more conservative, business-friendly faction of the Liberal Party. But once again, it all wound up being irrelevant because there was an election held on his 65th day in office and he lost it quite resoundingly to the new Conservative boss, Brian Mulroney. I like this political cartoon where you see Joe Clark rushing in to update the portraits of the Prime Ministers with the shortest terms and worst campaigns. So another guy for the F tier. So Brian Mulroney was in charge from 1984 to 1993 and is usually thought of as being part of the neoconservative wave that swept the English-speaking world during the 1980s. Historians usually lump him in with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher as three peas in a pod. In fairness, Mulroney was never quite as strident or ideological as those two, but his government did represent an attempt at course correction after the Trudeau years. He had an agenda of cutting taxes, deregulating industry, and privatizing government assets in the name of reorienting the country towards pure free market principles. His biggest accomplishment was negotiating free trade with the United States, which helped usher in a new era of economic integration across North America. I would say Mulroney is a B prime minister because his economic policies, although very controversial at the time, are more or less mainstream today. Like Trudeau, he also tried to dramatically change the Canadian constitution near the end, and his failure to do so prevented him from leaving a more dramatic legacy. Mulroney resigned in 1993, and to replace him, the Conservatives turned to Kim Campbell, a junior minister, only serving her first term in Parliament. But in a now familiar story, an election was held just a few weeks after she was sworn in, and she was defeated in a massive landslide. So, another F. 
Some have argued that Campbell might be the single worst, or at least most irrelevant, Prime Minister in Canadian history, simply because all of these other Fs at least had relatively important political careers before or after serving as PM, unlike her. If you want to learn more, I have a whole other award-winning video about Kim Campbell as well. So in 1993, the Liberals were elected back to power under Jean Chrétien. Chrétien was a longtime politician who had been one of Pierre Elliott Trudeau's most trusted cabinet ministers. He served three back to back terms as Prime Minister and was always relatively popular. If Mulroney represented the triumph of neoconservatism, Chrétien represented the triumph of neoliberalism, or the flavor of progressive politics that learned to make peace with things like deregulation and free trade because they were seen as being broadly effective. The 1990s were a time of relative peace and prosperity for Canada, and Chrétien is often given credit for presiding over those good times. After September 11th, 2001, Chrétien pledged to be an ally in the US-led War on Terror and committed Canadian troops to fight Islamist radicals in Afghanistan for what would wind up being the country's longest ever war. Near the end of his third term, foreign policy controversies consumed more of his time and attention, but I would say overall, he is probably mostly considered a B-tier Prime Minister. When Chrétien retired in 2003, he was replaced by Paul Martin, who is kind of in his own category as far as types of Prime Ministers go. He served for two years, which is not that long, but is also not short enough to make him a completely irrelevant F-tier guy either. Basically, Martin did the standard routine of taking over right before an election, except in this case, he actually won, narrowly. But then in 2005, the Parliament voted no confidence confidence in him, and there was a second election in two years, which he lost. Martin had been the highly influential finance minister under Chrétien, and was considered the sort of brains behind the Liberal Party's shift towards neoliberalism during the 1990s. But Martin's years as Prime Minister wound up being a bit of an anticlimax, and not much of note got accomplished beyond a two-year continuation of what were basically Chrétien's economic and foreign policies. He would probably have to be considered a D. The Conservative leader who beat Martin, Stephen Harper, served from 2006 to 2015, so he hasn't been out of power for very long, which obviously makes it a little bit difficult to objectively gauge his legacy. Harper fans often focus on his management of the Canadian economy during the 2008-2009 Great Recession, and credit him for the fact that Canada weathered that particular storm much better than many other countries. He was also quite hawkish on foreign policy matters, and worked hard to position Canada as a country that took very strong, principled positions on things like Russian aggression, or the regime in Iran, or Israel's right to defend itself, and that sort of thing. But on the other hand, his famously incremental approach to pushing Canada to the right meant that he never pursued any overly ambitious ideas. And the fact that he was ultimately voted out in favor of a man as dramatically different from him as Justin Trudeau certainly seems like a repudiation of his legacy in a way that, say, the Mulroney to Chrétien transition did not. So I think it would probably be fair to put him in the C tier, even though I personally respect him quite a bit. I don't want to rank Justin Trudeau himself because he's still in power, and regardless of what you think he's done so far, who knows what he might still get up to in a third or fourth term. So anyway, let's take another look at the overall tier list. I would say Canada is a pretty unusual country in terms of the sharp division we have when it comes to our leaders. They tend to either hang around for a very long time and be broadly successful, or only serve for an incredibly short time and accomplish basically nothing. We haven't really had that many objectively mediocre leaders. Which Canadian Prime Minister would you like to learn more about? Let me know in the comments, and I will see you next week.